is a talk on PowerPoints and lectures, or we might call it Zen and the Art of PowerPoint. In high school journalism class, I was taught there was one and only one way to position photos on a front page, upper right side, one way only. Since that time, other people have told me there is the one way to speak in public. Assume that all audiences have short attention spans always. There are people uh, who imagine they can purvey also the major algorithm for, magic algorithm, sorry, for PowerPoint. This talk will not be like that. I suspect that there is no magic bullet for bullet points. On the contrary, I'm gonna begin by suggesting that a major problem with PowerPoint is that we have come to think that there is just the one narrow way to use it. So, if so, what's the alternative to one way only? Um, to uh, borrow from Emerson, every man his own Jesus. Uh, Zen and the art of PowerPoint. Get into the Zen and use it for your purposes. Why not adapt PowerPoint to work for your own preferred teaching mode? Now, there's some people who would think that PowerPoint is to higher education as fish is to bicycle. Uh, academic PowerPoints, is that even uh, is a thing? Uh, is it necessarily an oxymoron? I'm going to tell you, I'm not by giving you the way to do it, I'm going to tell you my odyssey. Uh, I've been teaching uh, freshman sophomore philosophy for about uh, more than a quarter of a century now, and uh, PowerPoint for you, in use for that for about a decade. And so I'm going to talk from my experience, and if you find it helpful, uh, so much the better. I'm going to talk about two things, rationale for using PowerPoints in the first place, and then some particular techniques. Now, PowerPoint is known uh, generally as one of several available uh, kinds of presentation software. Hmm? Like spreadsheets and word processing, PowerPoint developed as an app for business, part of the Microsoft Office suite. That's why it's uh, so readily available. In fact, these things are open-ended tools. Nothing says that we have to fall into a pattern uh, set by business, quote, presentations. Think about Excel, for example, spreadsheets. Um, Lotus 1, 2, 3, if we remember the days of DOS, very kind of narrow application, but Excel is broader. Uh, Excel can be used for all kinds of lists, uh, great books, for instance. Even where it's not important to crunch numbers massively, it, it can organize information. Excel is great for organizing a spice cabinet. You know, I put my spices in boxes, I give them numbers, I have a spreadsheet. It tells me I want cinnamon, it's number, you know, 14. Um, and PowerPoint is like this too. Um, it can be used to organize your vacay pics. Um, one could even write a book in PowerPoint format, especially if the book needs lots of photos. I say this because I've done exactly that. I had a story to tell uh, of an army post uh, stretching over about a century from the Civil War to the onset of the Vietnam War. And in the process of research, I gathered something like 10,000 photos, maps, you know, other related uh, images. Uh, no way a standard publisher is going to do justice to that collection. Um, but PowerPoint, you have as many photos as you want. You could desktop publish, it's available. PowerPoint was developed as presentation software, and there are others, of course, uh, Prezi, Google uh, Slides, uh, etc. Um, and one might perhaps say some of the same things about these uh, platforms that I'm going to say about PowerPoint, but we're going to look today specifically at PowerPoint and how it might be useful for academic lectures. Question, what's the difference between a lecture and a, quote, presentation? Well, I think we've all seen the difference. Uh, often it's PowerPointlessness. Mm -hmm. uh, a shortage of wit, a shortage of motivation, and or both bad slides ahead. Usually they start this way. You're dumb and illiterate. I know my audience. I'm lazy and overly impressed with me and clueless about my subject. My boss made me do this and I hate it. The end. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of this sort of use of PowerPoint, uh, many people have come to see it as a monkey on their back, whether to present or to watch. PowerPoint has just gotten a bad rep for uh, being a crutch for the lazy and the clueless and the unprepared. But here's the thing. You are a lecturer, you are not a presenter. You know whereof you speak. What's your superpower? Well, your superpower is you know whereof you speak. And just ask yourself the question, how did I ever lecture before PowerPoint came along? 
well, you know, we used all kinds of visual aids, chalkboards, whiteboards, uh, sometimes these overhead projectors. Um, so here's the thing, just deliver your lectures as you always have and let PowerPoint help the traditional process. Hmm? Um, don't bark up the wrong tree, but use it wisely. Um, there is a point of view, of course, which says that PowerPoint is sparking up the wrong tree inevitably, that it's hopeless, that it's evil, that it's Stalinist. Uh, one commentator has, has noted power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Someone else says universities should ban PowerPoint. It makes students stupid and professors boring. And some of the complaints uh, in this indictment uh, do have some weight. Slides discourage complex thinking. Students come to think of a course as a set of slides. Slides discourage reasonable expectations. And to the extent that any of these things may be true, yes, they are problems. But it seems to me that PowerPoint itself doesn't make any lecturer automatically stupid or boring. Stupid and boring is an achievement um, which no other person uh, or thing can gift me. What did Benjamin Franklin say? We're all born ignorant, but it takes hard work to become stupid. Now, is PowerPoint abused in academic lectures? Oh, yeah. Um, for class today, I'll be reading the PowerPoint word for word, said every professor everywhere. Y'all ever sat in a class copying out every word off PowerPoint and still not known a darn thing the professor said? Hmm. Haven't we heard this before? So my proposed solution to this problem is let's get all medieval. Abusus non tolit usum. As the old scholastic philosophers used to say, the abuse of a thing does not deprive us of its proper use. Uh, can people commit vehicular homicide? Yes. Do we want to ban cars? No. Uh, abusus non tolit usum. Now, academic abuse of PowerPoint has its share of critics. And uh, here's uh, an interesting critic, Rebecca Schumann. Um, she studied at Vassar at New School, NYU, UC Irvine, writes in German and English, comments on the, uh, in the Chronicle of Higher Education and on Slate uh, on higher ed. Uh, one of the, one of the, the neat things about uh, in doing the research for this talk is I ran into her work, which I had not known before, and I, I highly recommend it. She's got some interesting things to say. Yeah, like Indiana Jones, she was a part-time uh, teacher. She tells this story in, in her book, Schadenfreude, a love story. Uh, Schadenfreude is one of those, those great German words uh, which, which don't translate exactly into English. Um, but here's what she says uh, in Slate about power pointlessness. Digital slideshows are the scourge of higher education. They are ruining teaching. Really? Ruining? Well, like me, you may find that Schumann's diatribe is clever and worth a look, but first of all, a lecture is not a slideshow. Secondly, a PowerPoint is not a lecture. Thirdly, the trick is to get the PowerPoint to work for the lecture while recognizing that they're not one and the same thing. Much of how we do this depends on how we conceive education. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to show my cards. Uh, I am one of those folks that thinks that teaching isn't simple content transfer. Uh, Socrates was not a content deliverer as the, um, as the current administrator phrase goes. Uh, we as teachers are not simply transmitting the material to absorbent students. Rather, Camille Pali hit the nail on the head when she said that teaching is a performance art. And I would add uh, performance art best done live. What? Do you mean students aren't customers? That, by the way, is the title of another, uh, another piece by Schumann. Because teaching is a performance art, two things. First of all, a good academic PowerPoint would never work as or in place of an online lecture. And therefore, I personally would never give my PowerPoints to anyone not enrolled in my course and attending the lecture. You know, somebody said to me, Kavanaugh, hey, I hear you're teaching a philosophy course. You know, could I have your PowerPoints? No. Yeah. Listen to the lecture. PowerPoints are back up for that lecture. After you listen to the lecture, hey, then you can use the PowerPoints. That's fine. And that's the way I do it with my students. Uh, they get the PowerPoints in PDF form as handouts after the lectures. So they can go on, and I'll talk about this a little more, embellish their notes and see, so on and so forth. The point is this. Let 
the dog wag the tail. Not the tail wag the dog. The PowerPoint, of course, is just the tail. Your lecture is the dog. Whether in business or in school, what's the main gripe about PowerPoints? Good news, everyone. I have invented a device that allows you to hear my voice as you read it. Hmm? Or worse, idea camouflage. You know, here's a remarkable idea. Now, lifeless in 127 monochrome slides, and I'll read word for word, word by word for the audience for the next 10 minutes, next 90 minutes, sorry. Um, anybody remember Dick Tracy? I'm gonna introduce Dick Tracy here as a kind of a tag. Um, every Sunday in the funnies, there was a little, little bit at the top of the Dick Tracy uh, page, uh, Crime Stoppers textbook, and it had uh, little holes in it. So presumably, uh, junior G men could cut it out and uh, punch holes and make a little textbook and, uh, and learn how to become crime fighters. And I'm gonna use Dick Tracy uh, as, a, uh, as a tag in the rest of my talk for you know, some suggestions uh, that might, practical suggestions that might be used. Well, here's my first tag from Dick Tracy. Here's a principle. Don't just read slides. Duh, seems kind of a no brainer. The challenge is figuring out how better to use PowerPoint. It's pretty easy to show what's wrong with the standard uses of PowerPoint. What if Darth Vader had access to PowerPoint? Which of these best gets Luke's attention? The PowerPoint or Darth directly? Um, PowerPoint would have camouflaged Darth's uh, leading idea. Also, uh, color uh, can be used effectively, can also be used, to in, uh, used ineffectively. Lack of color can be boring if you have 127 monochrome slides. But on the other hand, you can have a blooming, buzzing confusion. Too much color can be distracting. And if you use the little, you know, uh, bells and whistles, uh, which is flying in and the screen's fading away, et cetera, also distracting. Here's a suggestion, another Dick Tracy. Why not just ditch the templates? Why not drop the bells and whistles? Go for, when you open your PowerPoint slides, go for plain vanilla. Don't go for the preset templates. And here are a couple of illustrations that show why that might be. Um, the slide on the left hand, creators use the template, but there's a lot of color. It's very busy. It's very distracting. Background fights the text. The graphic is boring clip art and the graphic doesn't really illustrate the text. It's about um, women's work uh, in Japan and it shows um, two dead white European males climbing the ladder of success. What if you just do this? What if you just go for a diagram and a simpler background? Um, the words are a little more legible, the background doesn't fight the content. Or what if you just go for plain vanilla with no template at all? That says what needs to be said. Here's a graph uh, showing taxes on workers. Here's another graph. The busy graph, the plain vanilla, have the same content. Which one works better? Or instead of inserting a graphic in a slide, why not just blow the graphic up as the slide's background? Which one of these examples works better to convey what John Kennedy was saying in his inaugural speech? The creator of the left-hand slide uses lots of words. The type font is tiny and the clip art graphic adds nothing. How about as an alternative, this one. The right-hand sl sl slide, sorry, says no left, no less than the left-hand slide. Large color type makes the point 150,000 tons that stands out. And, you know, I would ask myself this question. If I were a student taking notes in this class, which of these slides would induce me to take clearer notes? And that should be the acid test. Here's another hint from Dick Tracy. Principle, outlines are not bad. Now, Schumann disagrees with this. One of her rules is first, never outline anything. And then she goes on to illustrate why that is so by giving an outline. Well, okay. That is one ludicrous outline strategy, but not because outlines are ludicrous per se. First, never outline anything. See, there's a piece of advice that's, again, trying to tell us there's one way only 
do be a do be and don't be a don't be and here are the hard and fast rules. Never outline anything? Well, it seems to me outlines and lectures can be good for a couple of things. One of them is foreshadowing. You know, let your audience know where you're going. And teachers have done this, you know, for a long time before PowerPoint. Here's what we're going to talk, here's what we're going to talk about today, here's where we're going, here's what we end, here's what you should expect to take away, and that sort of thing. Also, outlines are good for modeling. Okay. Outlines consists of, consist of words, but words can also be visuals in themselves. Uh, you do an outline for your students, it suggests to them that, hey, you know, this isn't just yada, 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 a bunch of yakking. There is a structure here. Uh, here again, the medium is also the message. If you do choose to use outlines, your outline can become a template, can become an exemplar to encourage your students to structure their own notes. Uh, and how can that not be a good thing? Go back to Schumann's example. The problems with this outline are, first of all, it's too dense, the type is too tiny, and lastly, it's just too busy. In any event, again, the PowerPoint shouldn't be just an outline because in the first place, a good academic PowerPoint isn't mainly words. Here's a principle. PowerPoint slides are best for visuals and audios. This is not a particularly good PowerPoint slide. Consider whether a very high ratio of pictures or words might be a good thing. So you want to show the Mona Lisa. Uh, this is the one I think from the Prado, uh, not, not the one in the Louvre. Uh, you want to talk about perspective and composition. Okay, the main focus of your slide should be the picture you're looking at. And then you, the lecturer, you're going to describe, you know, point by point what to look at and how to look at it. Your lecture's gonna supply the verbal narrative. PowerPoints are very good for adding visuals behind your words. Once again, it's a matter of dogs and tails. Or think of yourself, your lecture, as the headliner, uh, your Frank, your Smokey, and PowerPoint, your backup singers, the chorus line, the miracles. Enhanced visuals are a real plus of PowerPoint, also audio, also video. So, first of all, goodbye boring clip art. Um, it used to be, this is what we had. Um, after a while, I got hold of a scanner and started making my own, uh, particularly because I couldn't find for, for teaching philosophy in particular, the business oriented kinds of clip art just weren't all that useful. So if I wanted to talk about, you know, Bertrand Russell's uh, stuff, I would uh, make copies of that. Nowadays though, there's so much stuff readily available that my scanner doesn't get much use anymore. There are JPEGs, there are GIFs, animated uh, uh, clips, by the way, but basically. Um, there are lots of videos on YouTube. Um, the series, I'm going to show you one or two of these uh, uh, from uh, BBC4, uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, but uh, they're out there for, for a fair use, basically. Again, I'm telling you about my odyssey. Uh, for me, it's been a long way from having to order a, um, a projector from audiovisual, and then, you know, assuming that the work study students hours were compatible with class time, which often they weren't, then you got the whole film to show, you gotta look at the whole thing. But nowadays, we have not only individual segments of video already available online, think about YouTube, there are easy tools to snip and edit. If you have this, this is not long, no longer supported by Windows, but if you have an older uh, version of Windows, the old Windows Movie Maker is really easy to use and freebie. There's one uh, that I use now, I don't have Windows Movie Maker anymore, Shotcut, uh, free download, um, so that you can basically cut and paste or whatever, whatever you need. I'm going to show you an example. I mentioned the BBC4 before. Uh, of, of one that's available out there, you could just kind of drop into your uh, presentation. Um, and this is good. I use this in philosophy class, but I think, you know, if you're talking about introductory psychology or certainly if you're talking about linguistics, uh, anything, you know, where you want to acquaint students with the basic works of Noam Chomsky, um, this is a pretty good one. Narrated by Gillian Anderson uh, from the X-Files. Uh, let's give it a watch. Language sets us apart. Other animals communicate, but they don't have anything approaching the sophisticated grammar of human languages. How is it that we learn to speak and think in language so easily? Young children become adept in a new language very quickly. Since the dawn of philosophy, thinkers have argued about whether or not we have innate ideas, whether we are born knowing things as Plato believed, or rather, as John Locke and other empiricists argued, the mind is a blank slate on which experience writes. 
An American linguist, Noam Chomsky, gave a twist to this debate in the 1960s by demonstrating that children learning to speak just don't have enough information to form the complex grammatical maneuvers that allow them to generate unlimited new and original sentences. Yet they do so with ease. There's a poverty of stimulus. Something else must be going on. Chomsky's hypothesis was that there are inborn structures in our brain, what he called a language acquisition device, or LAD, which gives us a natural propensity to organize the spoken language that we hear in various grammatical ways. Without that, we couldn't get started as language learners. If he's right, language structure is hardwired as a kind of universal grammar. Our slates have been written on before we emerge from the womb. I love to run this video, cla video in class because I couldn't say it better or, or more concisely. Um, also, you notice, um, well, I, for my, my class, incidentally, um, by the time I show this, uh, we've already talked about nature and nurture, Plato and Locke. So my philosophy students will have had that background. But let's say you're teaching psychology and this is the first time you're introducing that topic. Well, you know, this video kind of you know, explains it as concisely as I could imagine. Also, you notice, by the way, when I use these uh, videos, I'll put the URL uh, on the uh, slide itself because again these are going to go eventually as handouts to the students and so if they want to go back and watch these for themselves the, the video clips are not going to show up obviously in, in a, a PDF uh, handout but uh, but they'll have the URL and then also it, it allows them to explore they'll see there's a whole series of these uh, BBC uh, video clips and so they'll maybe explore some others that might be useful to them. Um, I mentioned um, editing software like Windows Movie Maker or Shotcut how do you get these uh, videos in the first place? There's a great utility. Again, this is freeware um, called uh, Freemake. And basically it works, it only works with YouTube, but you take the URL from the YouTube video you want, you put it in and it copies it uh, as a file to your hard drive. Um, there is a, the free version uh, brands um, Freemake on each end of the clip uh, if you want to pay $50 for the the other version. And by the way, for me, I use this so often that the $50 as well, so that you can choose that. Otherwise, if you have the branding, you can always go into your video editor and clip that off. It's just a little more extra, still another extra step to do. But I, I highly recommend Freemake. It's uh, very useful. So cartoons, photos, GIFs, video clips, these could all work as great backup singers for the headline act that's your lecture. Let me give you some examples. Um, in logic class, when I talk about fallacies, the fallacy of suppressed evidence, the Pink Panther has a great bit on this. Now, in the days before, I used to say, you know, remember that scene in Pink Panther when, but one of the several ways uh, in which students miss a common core culture is that if they've seen films, they've seen current blockbusters, they don't really have a reference in, in some of the great classic films. And, and, and this, I think, is also, I notice it's also true of Proverbs. One has to explain those as well as, as, as cinema. Um, even if one or two students have seen that given film, though, the example is only as good as their variant abilities to recall the scene in question. So, um, when I talk about suppressed evidence, for example, uh, I give a rather one slide defining what it is, and then we watch uh, we watch it in practice here.
Because you dig that. And there you have the fallacy of suppressed evidence. Now, I don't rely on Inspector Clouseau to do my logic lecture for me, but I do suspect that the added visual might help fix that idea uh, in the heads of my students. Here's another example. Uh, you can use an arresting, arresting image, not such a long video clip, just a short GIF, to drive home the point that college work is going to be hard. Yeah. Expect your brain to do this. And uh, remind them, of course, also, as Fran Leibowitz says, there is no such thing as uh, inner peace. There's only nervousness and death. Therefore, if you're worried about stress, uh, first consider the alternative. Here's another example. PowerPoint allows the use of visuals that never could be chalked up. Okay, one of the things I like my students to learn is the Harvard Law School note-taking method, where you divide. If you go to Harvard Law School, it's the first thing you learn day one. Divide your paper in half with a line down the middle. Take your notes on one side, leave the other side blank. Why? Well, good reason. First of all, stage one during class, you take notes. Uh, I hope that you're actively listening. Um, Note-taking is not just stenography, transcription, you know, learning to listen and, and get the, the, the forest and not just all the trees. That's, uh, that's a skill and you will have to cultivate it. And, and you will cultivate that as you go through school. But it seems to me if you're going to take notes, then you're going to read them at some point. And that's stage two. I think for every class, you know, at least once a week, you should sit down with your notes, read them through and say, hmm, uh, what was going on here? What the hell did that idiot say all this week in philosophy class? Oh yeah, right. Uh, talked about two definitions of philosophy, talked about metaphysics, ethics and epistemology, right, got it. So I can go back and, and you know, impose some structure on my notes using the blank space. At stage two, Einstein's advice should be helpful. Um, you don't really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. So whether you do that to your actual grandmother or, or in your head, um, make yourself the lecturer and psychologically you will own the lecture. That's why you do that blank space. So you see, if you do this, you're ahead of the game. Uh, you get a Harvard education and you only pay Cougar tuition. Uh, what could be better than that? Now, would it be just as effective to give this little talk that I just gave about note taking with an old fashioned chalkboard or whiteboard? It seems to me it gains something um, with the, the ability to use the illustrations in the PowerPoint. Here's another example. In philosophy class, I talk a lot about uh, abstract ideas, toss out a lot of names. I want students to link the ideas with names and, and also I want them to think, you know, link names with faces. Oh yeah, right, Descartes. Uh, or, or, or Bacon, he's that guy with that Elizabethan collar, or, or Kant, he's that guy with that periwig. Now, one way um, to talk about Plato is to go yada, 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 Plato says, think about the cave, and here it is, yada, 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 yada. Or one could do something like this. What do you see here? Hmm, looks like shadow of a man, top hat and umbrella. And normally when we see a shadow, we expect that shadow to resemble the image which casts the shadow. But here's the problem. Look at the shadow there. It's cast by something that doesn't at all resemble a man with a top hat. Hmm, maybe things aren't always as they seem. Plato asked this very question 2,400 years ago and when he told a story, the allegory of the cave. Um, and basically there are a bunch of guys that come up in a cave all their lives have been chained there and it's very dark in the cave. All they see are shadows and to make things worse, the jailers like to play tricks on them. You know, they like to, there's a fire, which of course they can't see. They don't even know what a fire is, these prisoners, but the guards, you know, they, they do things like the you know, little bird uh, shadows on the wall and that kind of thing. But one day, one of these guys breaks his chains and he sneaks out of the cave. And what do you think happens? Well, first of all, he's blinded by the light. If you've ever, you know, my father used to do this. I hated this when I was a kid. Flip the light switch out. Okay, wake up. It's not painful, but it's 
it's comforting. And, you know, okay. But after a while, you get over it, you know, your eyes adapt, and then you're back to normal. And this is what happens to this guy. All of a sudden, he sees things that he's never seen before. First of all, he sees color, um, you know, in very dim light. We, we have two, uh, humans have two kinds of uh, visual receptors, the rods and cones. Uh, the cones see color, but they need uh, larger amounts of light. The rods see only black and white, but they can operate in, in dim uh, dim light. Uh, not all species do. Dogs, for example, don't have color vision like we do. So, by the way, if you're thinking about buying your dog a TV, just buy them the black and white set there. Don't, don't waste your money on the color. Um, yeah, we used to do this in, in, uh, in, in psychology class. Uh, you can do this experiment very easily. Sit in a room, sunlight's coming in, the sun's going down, and fix your gaze on an object, a colored object, for example, a red lamp. And there comes a point at which that red lamp turns to gray. Well, as the sun goes down. Did the, the lamp actually ch change color? No, what happened was your cones cut out and your rods remain. So you're seeing the black and white and gray you're no longer seeing the color. And that's, you know, the reverse of that is what this fellow experiences. So and he sees horses and people, he sees trees, he sees water, he sees blue sky. He looks, he could actually see his hands and he could see there are other people who have similar uh, digits and appendages and it's just overwhelming. And then all of a sudden he comes to himself and he thinks, oh my God, my, my buddies are back in the cave. I better go back there and tell them what's out here. So he sneaks back in the cave and he tells them, what do you think they do? <laughs> <laughs> they laugh at it. You're an idiot. That's all there is. You know, these, these things in front of us on the screen, that's, that's all there is. So this is, you know, Plato's allegory of, of, of philosophy, how it's uh, coming to see the truth is hard work. Uh, it's painful. Uh, but once you acquire it, trying to transmit that to other people, uh, those who are still stuck in the cave, uh, difficult, they may, may very well laugh at the philosopher. Um, Plato takes away from this uh, the notion that things which are least real are the things we can see and touch, the things which exist in what he calls the twilight world of change and decay. And so the cave becomes a metaphor for the entire human condition. Uh, this is not Plato's phrase, but basically he says, and we all suffer from cave consciousness. Cave consciousness is a kind of sleep and finding one's way out of the cave is a kind of awakening. Shouldn't Plato be getting screenwriting residuals for The Matrix? The Oops. Matrix. You gotta remember the, uh, the humans floating around in the vats of KY jelly, who's and why is keeping them alive, stimulating their brains to make them believe that they were experiencing the real world, the world we all think we know. Well, uh, almost 20 year old spoiler alert here, some of them come out and find that the real world was a desolate wasteland and the lives everyone thought they were living were just fabrications set in their brains. A select few were rescued from the illusion, but some of them were so unhappy in the real world that they chose to return to the illusion. But Neo and the others who chose to stay and fight were the philosophical heroes of the movie choosing truth at the cost of comfort and happiness. Yes. So they got woke. Uh, wake up, the Matrix has you. What is the Matrix except Plato's cave reimagined? And what is wokeness like according to Plato? What happens when we exit the cave? For Plato, the physical eye deceives knowledge is about ideas about insensate objects, not the sensate ones. And it's rather with the mind's eye that we acquire knowledge. So the eyes are useless if the mind is first blind. Most of us, Plato thinks, walk about with our mind's eyes wide shut. And this occurs because the superficial world, twilight world of change, decay, and shadows, which the physical eye sees, uh, distracts us. Ordinary sense experience stands in the way of good sense. And as in the matrix, what most people call the real world, hmm? It's for Plato the least real. It's the other world, the world of ideas and forms where reality resides, not in the material world of ordinary sense experience. There ain't no way, says Plato, to hide your lion eyes. So his big takeaway from this realization is going to become characteristic of, of the rationalist movement in philosophy. We, learn, we need to learn to mistrust what our senses seem to teach us. Now, when John Locke comes along, he's going to counterband Plato, and we'll see this when we get to that section. But in saying what he says, Plato stands common sense on his head, because for Plato, the real is what we don't see, and the stuff we see is the least real. Hmm? That's backwards, or most of us. 
If Plato was right, though, one of the consequences of this is that most of us are deceived ordinarily, thoroughly, most of the time. In other words, we are victims of false consciousness. Now, false consciousness is not a term we find in Plato. In fact, it is a term we find in a later philosopher uh, by the name of Marx, uh, who tells us that humans are deceived routinely about our circumstances, particularly about money. You know, Marx is still worth reading. Great thing about Marx is, you know, he has this, this sarcastic take, you know, I can tell you're lying, your lips are moving, and you're talking about money. Um, that often happens. But Plato is much more radical even than Marx. Plato thinks that false consciousness goes much, much deeper. Marx thinks it's about money. Plato thinks it's about everything. And their advice is the same, quit sleepwalking. Here's the wake-up call. Now, People don't like to hear the wake-up call. Remember in Plato's story, they all laughed at the guy who came back into the cave. But here's the philosophy wake-up call. Whether it's Plato or Marx or Jean-Paul Sartre or, ooh, who's this other philosopher? You'd best unscrew yourself. Prime cowboy, did the proctologist find your head yet? Hmm. Well, psychologists suspect that some people may be delusional Philosophers suspect that all people may be delusional, and Plato was the one that started. Ever heard of beer goggles? Well, Plato's message is we wear cave goggles. Now, do beer goggles work? Yes. Is that any recommendation for them? No. Um, here's proof that they work. Um, eight o'clock, oh, not so good. 10 o'clock, she's looking better, and by uh, closing time, oh, you done drunk that poor girl pretty. And if you think that's the sexist point, uh, look at the bottom, you can see the same thing works for men as for women. For Plato, learning philosophy is a lot like sobering up, como un plato de menudo. Uh, the cure for being stuck in this twilight world of change and decay is to get woke, get out of the cave. So join the Plato's Cave Alumni Association. Do graduate, please. Now, I wonder, that was my little talk on Plato. Um, which strategy is going to make the cave more memorable? Um, the yada, yada, yada story or the uh, PowerPoint enhanced story? Here's another example. Are comedians the only ones still capable of speaking large truths? Consider throwing in a few laughs while discussing large truths. Here's a good example from Bill Maher, who does, does a lot of this. America's rich aren't giving you money. They're taking your money. Between the years 1980, between the years 1980 and 2005, 80% of all new income generated in this country went to the richest 1%. Let me put that in terms that even you fat ass teabaggers, sorry, can understand. Hey. Say a hundred Americans get together and order a hundred sliced pizza. The pizza arrives, they open the box, and the first guy takes 80 slices. <laughs> and if someone suggests, why don't you just take 79 slices, that's socialism! Now, notice what I've done. I've put a video in, but I've also been able to add some words and also put in uh, an icon of a pizza because that's his main metaphor in this talk. Um, and the URL, of course, as I mentioned before, the URL is going to show up later in the PDF handout. Um, unlike just showing the raw video clip, though, if I show the video clip in the PowerPoint platform, then I can also add a few things to it. Uh, the supplemental graphic, graphic to the extra words. Um, I do this kind of thing as a uh, uh, startup in my class. I want them to learn um, some the classic jazz tradition. Just does not has nothing to do with philosophy. It's just I think that should be part of their education. And so I want to show them some some small groups, but also I can put on see here uh, who the players are, so they don't just watch the video and hear the music. But if they want to follow up, if they think Mingus is good, they want to hear some more stuff by Mingus. They know now who he is. Remember, however, words can be visuals too. Hmm? Notice how in the current PowerPoint, I tend to put uh, words in large and colorful format. You have all kinds of ways to do this. Uh, you can choose plain vanilla text boxes in different sizes, different colors. 
You could also choose word art, which is a feature of various uh, various apps in the Microsoft uh, Office suite. And you can do, you know, interesting things with them, like make them go around in circles, et cetera, if you want. Um, I don't do that a lot. When I, when I talk about circular reasoning, that's always good <laughs> beyond that. However, you can go up to 95 uh, point type. Um, Word art format is good for emphasizing major points in lectures. And this is not the same thing as just writing the whole lecture on the screen. So, you know, when, when I make transitions, for example, from one topic to another, I want to make sure I put one of these kinds of slides in there. Uh, if it's something that I would, in, in the past, have, ch have chalked up on the board, probably it's the sort of thing that I want to put in large word format as a transitional slide. So fewer words can be better. But on the other hand, can many, many words ever be a good thing? I think possibly, possibly so. Um, I find it's occasionally useful to toss up maximum words and say to the students, don't copy all this now, incorporate it later once the PDF handout arrives. So for example, when I talk about Thales and animism, um, I give them this kind of dense slide and I say, look, think about your Harvard note-taking method, you know, put the headings in, Fusus, Thales' view, nature, animism, the prior view of which his view replaced, okay, leave some space, and then you can come back and embellish later. Don't, don't sit there and try to copy it on. Again, note-taking is not stenography. Note-taking is not court reporting. Um, maximizing text on selected PowerPoint slides might be a way to reinforce the notion that, that effective note-takers are not just stenographers. In any event, um, are we more likely to discover a magic cookbook for academic PowerPoint uh, than we are for any other aspect of teaching? Probably not. So once again, back to Emerson. Improvise, every man his own Socrates. Um, I'm giving you again some suggestions for my odyssey, uh, my particular uh, discipline, uh, my courses and yours will be different, no doubt. No doubt each lecturer is going to evolve his or her own styles for academic PowerPoint. I, I say this because I, I, I know because I did it. Um, until fall 2011, that's not even 10 years ago, I was still using 1964 projection technology, those plastic overlays, which were usually black and white on an overhead projector. Now, the old overhead projectors placed a premium on cramming as much as possible, and also because handouts were paper and not digital, cramming and content uh, kept down paper costs. But nowadays, we have the possibility of digital handouts. These are easy, these are cheap. I take my PowerPoint, I put it into uh, Adobe Acrobat format, and I email it. And the students can open it up, look at it, enlarge it, use it to embellish their notes, do lots of things with it. As a result of my converting my overhead, plastic, old plastic overheads to PowerPoints, I found myself breaking up uh, one previous slide into many slides. Uh, so for example, in 2011, I had one sort of mixed black and white slide on Daedalus. Uh, we talk about Daedalus in terms of, of Socrates. And by 2015, that had expanded to four slides. The type size has gotten larger uh, and I'm able to use color. Ironically, we go back to Schumann's critique. Um, one of uh, her problems with, with her example of an outline is that the type fonts are so tiny. Let me recommend from my experience, 28 point font. Um, I, unless I do a footnote you know, with an asterisk at the bottom of the page, so 28 point is the minimum I wanna use. 48 point is often better. You have 96 point um, uh, maximum, but in the pull down, but you know, I, you might have noticed this also in other uh, Microsoft Office applications. You can always always create your own size. You can type in 120 points, in, 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 even though it's not on the list. You can do 200 points if you want. Um, so it's, there's a considerable amount of flexibility. But here I find it's a good rule of thumb. If I'm in doubt about whether a slide can be seen, I print it. I put it on the deck, I stand up, I look at it. If I can read it standing up, so my students can read it. Or if you have time to go into your classroom, just run a trial run of the PowerPoint uh, from the back of the room. And if you can see it from the back of the room, they can see it too. I've multiplied slides as I've moved from the plastic overlays to the PowerPoint. There could be other reasons for multiplying slides. And that has to do with graphics. And here's again, another Dick Tracy uh, crime stoppers uh, technique. Um, I, for lack of a better word, I call this expanding by shrinking. Um, I take a graphic, I show it first, and then I go on to shrink the graphic a little bit and add some words. So that famous, uh, very important graphic by Piketty and Sainz. Um, 
that, uh, that the great compression, as, as economists call it, it shows uh, the way in which uh, income uh, inequality uh, went down over the course of the 20th century only to come back up at the end of the 20th century into the 21st century resembling what it was at the beginning of the 20th century. I want that graphic to have the opportunity to speak for itself. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to show that graphic. Take a minute to look at this. What do you see? Well, okay, let's see. Um, there is um, this, this big peak over here at the beginning of the 20th century. And then there's this big trough here in the middle of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And then there's a corresponding peak again at the end of the 20th century. Hmm. So what we're looking at is, look at the title, uh, top 1% pre-tax income share over the course of about a century from 1913 to 2012. Hmm. Now, having, I hope, rested attention by showing how shocking it is to contemplate that inequality has been drastically reduced only to see it reintroduced, I began to add some words and images. Um, so, you know, we see uh, what people used to call the Gilded Age by the time of the Great Depression and the New Deal, World War II, uh, inequality is being reduced. It stays at a low point uh, throughout what uh, the French call the Trente Glorieuse, uh, the 30 glorious years until the 1970s when, and this, is, this coincides with the regimes of uh, Mrs. Thatcher, uh, in Britain and Mr. Reagan in this country, it begins again to go up so that now uh, economists are talking about um, a new gilded age in our own time. Then I shrink the graphic just to introduce a little a few more words, which is basically what I just said in the voiceover. So I wonder, might multiplying slides in this manner, expanding by shrinking, make for a more informative lecture? Here's another suggested rule of thumb. This isn't mine, but it might be worth following. Uh, no more than three bullet points per slide, no more than 20 words per slide. But again, you know, as a rule of thumb, uh, there's no magic bullet here, but as a rule of thumb, less is more, seems to me to make sense. I find that I could be subtle about the number of words too. For example, um, in, when I lecture on fallacies, um, I talk about um, the, the, the fallacy of uh, the gambler's fallacy, you know, where you think it's, uh, it's, it's only a matter of time, the law of averages, blah, 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 blah. Um, there is in investing something called the martingale strategy, which sounds superficially like the gambler's fallacy, but which isn't. So I think not everyone in my class is an investor and maybe not all of them go to Vegas, I don't know. But for those interested, I put the slide in and I skip over it during the talk uh, so they can read it afterwards. Again, large print, great for what's important right now. Read the stuff in the digital handout, the fine print, but pay attention to what's in the large print. And again, my rule of thumb here is if it was major enough that I wanted to write it out on the chalkboard, uh, this is how I write it in PowerPoint uh, now. Um, here's another principle. Um, PowerPoints are not standalones. Hmm? Back to Schumann. Um, my slideshow doesn't make sense. Good. Your slideshow itself should be incomprehensible. Let me restate that, rephrase that, repeat that. A good academic PowerPoint will be incomprehensible. What? Why? Well, it will be incomprehensible absent the accompanying lecture. For example, go back to the Dick Tracy slide from, from earlier on. Would this slide have made sense if I not explained it? No. And if someone were just looking at my PowerPoints without having heard the talk uh, which they back up, then that would make sense. That's why a good academic PowerPoint will be incomprehensible. And, and, and Schumann goes on to quote Wittgenstein, uh, its most important part is what's not on it. That is to say, you actually talking with people. And this is why I said previously, uh, personally, I would never give my PowerPoints to anyone not enrolled in, in my course attending my lecture. Here is someone else's good example of incomprehensibility, okay? Um, 72% of part-time workers in Japan are women, or you could just show a Japanese woman with 72%. Now, the one on the right is a little bit cryptic. It's incomprehensible by itself. If someone were reading your PowerPoint without, without the accompanying lecture, that would be a problem, but with the lecture, no, it's not. Um, Students who attended the lecture, taking good notes, would understand this. So again, the importance of incomprehensibility follows from the previous point 
that your lecture is the headline act in PowerPoint is your backup. So the lecture is Diana and the PowerPoint is Mary and Flo. Hmm? So channel your inner James Brown, but what would James be without those famous flames? Hmm. Um. <laughs> that is a video clip. Okay, well, um. hmm. Arrow options. There we go. Yeah, believe it or not, that was a free concert in Santa Monica in 1964. And, and uh, following James Brown with the Stones, Jagger said that's the worst decision they ever made uh, coming after this performance by James Brown. It's worth seeing. Um, incomprehensibility may not preclude the following highly tedious conversation. I've had it, perhaps you have as well. Student says, so I missed your lecture, but I can just read your PowerPoints, right? Mm, nope. Personally, my strategy is threefold. I assign text to be read, I lecture on the topic of the text, and I use my PowerPoints to supplement both of the first two. So my teaching strategy is like a three-legged stool. But what happens when a three-legged stool loses a leg? In my strategy, at least none of these three components is just redundant for any lecture. Uh, I'll never, ever, ever in any lecture just regurgitate to students what they can read for themselves. Uh, it's pointless and, and probably insulting. Um, by the same token, if PowerPoints were just a summary of the other two components, why bother with them? Don't imagine, though, that I don't have to rehearse this strategy uh, again and again. So, says one student to the other, do we have to, like, read or anything? No way, Jack. Just get the PowerPoints. Um, psst, no. Oh, my God. I didn't take any notes for this class. No sweat. The prof gives us his notes. Psst. PowerPoints are not my lecture notes, nor are they your class notes. They are not notes in the first place. Now, this is an uphill struggle. Doesn't it stand to reason that if PowerPoint users have already fallen into PowerPoint listless and near presentation, that this process will have created distorted expectations uh, among PowerPoint viewers, including our students. So that, you know, students come to think of a course as a set of slides. And so if one wishes to use PowerPoint in a smarter way, this is going to entail ongoing encouragement to students to unlearn some things. But I guess, you know, PowerPoint should be no exception to Karl Popper's uh, general rule about language use. It's impossible to speak in such a way that you cannot be misunderstood. You know, you can go so far in the direction of clarity, and you should, but you can never, never, by your presentation, entirely overcome all of it. So, uh, maybe we need these t-shirts. RTFS, what, what does that say? What's the English translation? Please read the syllabus. Now, the main point of my talk today has been that there is nothing about the PowerPoint application as such that condemns us of necessity to PowerPointlessness, and PowerPoint can have some real advantages for higher education. Each lecturer might well adapt PowerPoint to their own strategy. In summary, PowerPoint need not be stupid, PowerPoint has new features that can support a traditional lecture. PowerPoint can be a good tail if the lecture can be a good dog. And isn't he a good dog? And last, PowerPoint works best if it's not a standalone and not just a redundant copy of the lectures or readings. So this concludes uh, my talk on PowerPoints and lectures. Um,